simplify. We've been going through a series, and the whole intent is to keep things a bit more simple, a little more concise, not as distracting. I read something uh, just this week, and it said uh, four words that could destri- describe many lives today. Bigger, better, faster, and more. <laughs> then it said, many attempt to be it all, do it all, have it all, and have created a complex world that moves too fast, delivers too little, and demands too much. Is it really possible to break free of our high speed, high pressure, high demand, guilt producing, and then uh, put the word this way, D-I-S dash E-A-S-E, not disease, but dis-ease with our complex lives. Now, I am not a proponent of us in many ways going back to what some would describe as the good old days. Hey, God redeemed me from a lot of that stuff. I like to hear stories about Jack Davis being able to have heart surgery on Wednesday and go home on Friday, and you can probably just go on back to work. That's just amazing to me. Because I remember the day when they used to do heart surgery, and, uh, you know, you're in a hospital, it seemed like about six or eight months. You couldn't pick up anything after you got out. I mean, it was really a little bit different than what we have today. Simplify what we've been looking at in previous uh, messages. Number one is uh, it'd be real important as we seek to get the distractions out of our lives. There's so much to enjoy today. And uh, I, I signed the end of my, uh, on my phone messages, cherish the moment. And uh, I think the older I get, the more that becomes big, bold print for me. Those things are so special to me anymore, uh, just being able to sit down with a friend and uh, just enjoy a cup of coffee and talk about God's good hand and all the wonderful things that way. And as best we can, not to be so busy. You know, there's a, there's a fine line of being too busy and not trusting God. So week number one, we looked at uh, it's important to have a daily time in the Word before we have our time in the world. Just set aside some time with God every day, and earlier is better, I think. At least I would encourage at least an element of that. Number two, find rest in the Savior. Remember the oxen just fighting against each other when things are not striving together well, and there's a wearing out that happens. Give up your anxious heart for God's perfect peace, Philippians chapter 4. Look at a time of plan, act, renew, and review. Gives a good thing just to look over what God's done in your life, what God's doing in your life, and what God, if Lord willing, will do in your life. Number six, just enjoy the presence of God. Last week, we had a little bit of a different approach with Valentine's Day and I think it was Pastor Wendell's birthday and Jessica Pichardo's birthday and some other birthdays on the 14th. I guess that could be a good thing. Take time to live love and just go about it that way. Tonight, our passage in Mark chapter 12, I'll look at verses 28 through 34. And it begs a couple of questions that I came across um, in preparation for this. And those two questions to help us kind of focus and um, see to simplify our lives a bit more, those two questions would be this. In a busy, hectic society, uh, go, go, go. What do you want to be known for? Question number one. And question number two is if you could be known for one thing, if you could just be known for one thing, what would it be? Now, Paul said this one thing. If it's known for one thing, what would it be? Let me ask this question this way tonight. What do you say is the biggest barrier to you slowing down and simplifying your life? What do you say is that biggest barrier for you slowing down and simplifying your life? Mark chapter 12 takes us to a passage where a few questions come to Jesus, and 
as he so perfectly does, he knows how to take those questions and oftentimes turn them back into another question or certainly clear the air and get right to where the real gist of the reason for the question in the first place. And we have a, a group that come to him and they ask some questions of him and uh, they are part of the religious and the political establishment and so they become curious. In Mark chapter 12, the Word of God tells us in verse 28 through 34, and one of the scribes, or we, we would refer to him as a, as a lawyer type, one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together and perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, which is the first commandment of all? And Jesus said, him, answered him, the first of all the commandments is hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul, with all thy mind and with all thy strength, this is the first commandment. And the second is like, namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There's none other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said unto him, Well, master, thou hast said the truth, for there is one God, and there is none other but he. And to love him with all the heart, with all understanding, with all the soul, with all the strength, and to love his neighbor as himself is more than a whole burnt offering and sacrifices. He's going Old Testament on him. And when Jesus saw that he answered discreetly, he said unto him, Thou art not far from the kingdom of God. And no man after that durst ask him any question. No man after that dared ask him another question. You know, I don't want it to be the case tonight, but perhaps it could be the case tonight that someone is here and they're so close. Been in church all their lives. Grew up in a Christian family, perhaps, or perhaps someone watching on Facebook Live or live stream, and, and they've been exposed to Christianity, been all about Christianity, perhaps even read some of their Bible. Been to church a lot. Can quote Scripture. But still trusting in good works and heritage or whatever it might be that get them to heaven. Just like this scribe. So close, so close. What would I have to do with our message tonight and simplify? Let, let me uh, go about it this way. A few questions that are, are brought to Jesus. He was asked a question of authority. If we went all the way back to chapter 11 and verses 27 and chapter 12 through uh, verse 12, the question of authority comes up and Jesus moves closer to the cross now. He's starting to come to his day of crucifixion. He finds himself under some severe attack from the religious Jews. And the Pharisees and the Herodians uh, gathered as a group. And they normally were bitter enemies, but this particular time they're together and they want to question Jesus about ownership and responsibility. And Jesus, in his uh, perfect way, and I won't read those passages, you can read them later, but verses 13 through 18, he proceeds to just embarrass them. Another question of responsibility comes up in 18 through 27, and uh, he proceeds to help put them in their poetic place again. And then another question comes up about eternity, and Jesus is speaking to the Sadducees, and he reminded them of why they were sad, listening to their conversation. Then a question came up about priority, verses 28 through 34 is where we'll handle things tonight. Now, another question came up after that. That was about identity, and that continued on in verses 35 through 38. We'll rest on verses 30, uh, 28 through 34 tonight for our particular message. And there's a motive uh, that seemed to be uh, a little bit evil with some of the questioning, and there was some tempting that seemed to be involved. But Jesus knew exactly how to answer the question. And he knew exactly what words to use in answering the question, that it would resonate with them. It's a good thing for us to learn that when we're sharing the gospel as well. Just to know who we're talking to, know some environment about them, and then be able to know our scripture. That's why it's important for us to stay in the word of God, that that Holy Spirit can bring those words up when it's just right. So won't we ask God to be with us on this message just for a few minutes? Only two questions. And then I'll give three points to those two questions, and I've got an illustration for you. 
and we'll go. Father, you're good to us. We're thankful. Uh, we're, we're overwhelmed that we can just come to you anytime. We can ask you anything. And we can trust that you are God Almighty and you answer perfectly. And we ask you to meet with us tonight, Lord, and continue on with this service. Might it be honoring to you? Might the message be something that exalts our Savior, Jesus Christ? Might our understanding be a little deeper in your word? Lord, might our closeness to you, our likeness to you, be just a little bit stronger after our time here tonight. Thank you for the privilege just to communicate with you and to leave it with you. Lord, we had many prayer requests tonight, many for health and restoration to bodies. You're perfect. We're not bringing news to you, Lord. We're just bringing recognition to you that you're God and you can do anything. Thank you. We leave it with you now in Christ's name. Amen. Right, we look at this uh, passage tonight, and I make three points, two questions, and Jesus gives an answer. So Jesus asked a question in Mark chapter 12, verse 28, and the question comes to him, what is the greatest or first commandment? Verse 28, and one of the scribes came, and having heard this reasoning together and perceiving that he had answered them well, you might say that term well means beautiful. He really gave a really eloquent answer is how they would look at that. Ask him, which is the first commandment of all? And Jesus spoke with the Sadducees, a man that was listening, a lawyer, a scribe, someone that would be interpreting the law as the Bible speaks. That would be his profession. And Jesus answered him, and he recognized it. He answered him well. He answered him beautifully. He answered him completely is how uh, it would be acknowledged by the scribe. That's why he would use a word like he answered him well. There's no wiggle room. Jesus totally shut down any kind of diversion that he would come back to him with. He knew exactly how to answer him in a way that he would get it, in a way that it would clear it up for him, in a way that it wouldn't create a distraction in his mind. So the Jewish scribes and the rabbis, they had, they had a lot of laws, 613 of them. 613 of the laws. Now, my understanding of those 613, they were even arguing about which ones were positive and which ones were not so positive or negative. 248 of them were viewed as positive somewhat in nature. 365 of them were viewed as negative. And these were, commands were subdivided into two groups, what they considered heavy and what they considered light. And then they would argue about which ones were heavy and which ones were light. This was their constant way of life. You know, you'll find some that, would, some that would talk about the Bible. They'll talk about Scripture. They'll debate about Scripture. They'll discuss Scripture. They'll look all kinds of studies about Scripture, but they never come to totally trust Scripture. They never come to totally trust the Word of God. And that's exactly what we find here with these scribes and the Pharisees and the Herodians. They were arguing back and forth. It, you know what brings to my mind here? Probably this same verse comes to your mind. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 7 says that there are some that are, and you, you can probably finish it for me, ever learning but unable to come to knowledge of the truth. There's always a debate about it. Well, it must be this. Well, it must be that. And they, they would constantly go back and forth. Having heard Jesus answer the Sadducees so well, this man thinks that perhaps Jesus can settle the debate for them. So he wants to get his opinion about it. And so Jesus answered the question. He's asked the question, now he's answered the question. In verses 29 through 31, you know it well. Jesus answered him, the first of all commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. He was answering him in a way that it would resonate with him. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength, and with the first commandment. And the second is like, namely, is this. Now, you've heard of this, and perhaps you've seen some very conservative Orthodox Jews that would wear uh, what they call a pair of, what is it, paracletes, that they would wear those laws, and you would see this little box. And you can find it today on some very conservative uh, Orthodox Jews. 
wear the box with the laws in the box wrapped around their arm, Deuteronomy 6 stuff. Some of them would put it like plates on their forehead. They would have a box up there. You can find it today. And they would have those laws there, and they would pray those laws in the morning, and they would pray in the evening, trying to keep the law. They were religious. They missed the thing with Jesus about the relationship. They were religious. You know, some are religious about going to church. You find it odd? Probably not as odd as it has been in the past, but still some are very religious about certain things. And we would look at them as a good thing, going to church. But that person has gone to church and it has become habitual for them, which is not a bad habit, especially if it's a church that's preaching a clear gospel. There's opportunity for the Word of God to penetrate. But God forbid that there would be some that are here tonight or some that are watching at some point tonight or in the future, and they are putting their trust in just going to church. Or they are putting their trust in something else that they thought was the answer. But they never have connected with a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what we find here. Want to make it too complicated. Want to make it too distracting. Want to make it too laborious. Want to make it too hard. It's simple. Not to say it's easy. Not to say it didn't cost the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Didn't say it wasn't expensive. But he made it simple. Look at the ones he called to be his disciples. Did he go and call the professors out of the religious schools? No. No. And did he go and get in a long debate with them? No. He said, follow me. You know, many make it just way too complicated. And as that complication allows to swirl in their minds, it allows opportunity for distraction. And so he answers them with Shema, which is written down, placed in a small box that we would call it, in Deuteronomy 6 and verse 9, where they would be faithful to write it on the post of the house and the gates. And they would, they would be faithful religious people to do that. But Jesus goes right to Scripture, and he establishes three three truths in verse 29. Verse 29, he says, God is all-powerful. He uses the name Lord or Yahweh, the self-existent one, the name of God, Elohim, the creator. The name is plural, and he's starting to evidence the Trinity. He's giving them clarity. He says God is powerful. He says God is personal, verse 29. He said the Lord, our God. The Lord, our God, he is one God. He's personal. He's powerful. He's personal. He's preeminent. He's unique. The Lord is one. J. Vernon McGee says it this way. We could render it, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. And Jesus knew that if he spoke to the scribe this way, that he would recognize it as Old Testament and he would get it. So he responds to him this way. The Lord is one. He is the only one. He's powerful. He's personal. He's preeminent. In one verse, he responds to him. And then Jesus takes, in their case, 613. We would say sometimes 10 commandments. And he boils it down. He simplifies it. And he gives two. He gives two. And here's what he says. Number one. Love God with all you have. Love God with all you have. Verse 30. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength. And this is the first commandment. Agape love is what he's telling us as we talked about a little bit last week. Unconditional, purposeful, committed. Love 
God with all you have. Everything about you. Love God. Love the Lord. The master. Love the master with everything. Let him be thy God. Personal God. Can you say he's your God? Or you just associate with ones that say he's your God. Is he personal? And you've probably talked to many and shared the gospel with them or attempted to share the gospel, and they will say, that's personal. And we could say to some degree, yes, it is a personal decision for you to accept Jesus Christ. But once you do that, you go public, and you want to make sure everybody knows that as possible. So it is personal to make that decision, to accept Christ, thy God, with all thy heart, everything about the heart, with all thy soul, everything about the emotions and the will, everything about the mind, the intellect, everything about the strength, the power, everything in your ability. Love the Lord thy God. Thy God. The idea presented here is that we love God with everything in our being. Everything in our being. The Lord has given us perfect, complete love. That's what he gave to us. And he loves us with everything he has. Can't deny that. He sacrificed himself on the cross for us. Everything he had. And he says, love the Lord your God with everything you have. Everything you got. Love him with everything. Then he gives another answer. That's the first commandment. Then he gives another. He said, love your neighbor as yourself. Verse 31. He says, love your neighbor as yourself. And the second is like, namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment that is greater than these. Love your neighbor with agape love. Love your neighbor as a good Samaritan said. And that would be anyone. <laughs> I read a quote that said, you know that neighbor thing? That's anybody with a skin suit would be your neighbor. So love anyone. Love your neighbor as yourself, as yourself, as yourself. Have you taken care of yourself today? Have you taken care of yourself in a good way this week? He says, love your neighbor that way. Love your neighbor that way. This kind of love is seen in the Lord Jesus Christ who's willingly gave himself. Romans chapter 5, uh, verse 8. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. The love is explained in 1 Corinthians 13, verses uh, 1 through uh, 8 that we've recited so many times here before. If we love like this, there'll be no problems at home. There'll be no problems at work. There'll be no problems in the neighborhood. There'll be no problems in the community. No problems anywhere if we love like this. If all Christians love like this, Then he says there's no other commandment greater than these. No other commandment greater than these. He boils it down to two. A couple of questions I'd ask. I don't know if I have them in your hand out or not. How, I can, how can I get better at what Jesus says matters most? Loving him and loving others. How can I get better at what Jesus says matters most? How can I be the best neighbor lover I can be. Fair question to ask. How can I be very practical with that? Here's another. If we moved out of our neighborhood, would anyone care? If you moved out of your neighborhood, would it, would it matter? <laughs> I don't know about our neighbors, us mattering to them, but they would matter to us because we got terrific neighbors. If we're talking neighborhood neighbors. In fact, we stay where we are probably as long as we have because of them. And we tell them that. We're very thankful. And I have to think about it often. Boy, do I love others? And I don't know that they're looking at the Scripture and say, I need to love the joiners like that. But I ask that question. Boy, I, I wonder if we mean as much to them as they mean to us. They always have a great attitude. They're always quick to respond when we ask for some assistance and helping out. Or I'll tell you how crazy it is for us and our neighbors. Uh, we have access to each other's homes. I have no qualms about it. And uh, they're very trustworthy. 
They trust us. And I think, wow, that, that's a challenging thing. Now, if we could just duplicate that everywhere, it'd be a different world. The scribe answered with this, this term. He answers this way. Verse 32, and the scribe said unto him, well, master, but that's a great answer. That's a beautiful answer you just gave. There is one God to love him perfectly and to love others perfectly. It's far more important than other religious rituals in the world. Love them. Love them. And he says, you're so close. And then you get down to verse 34, and his response is, after he gave that answer, he dared not ask another question. Yikes. Didn't ask any more questions. I'm not going there anymore. He is too good to answer. And his response is in verse 34, And when Jesus saw that the answer discreetly said unto him, Thou art not far from the kingdom of God. You're not far from the kingdom of God. You ever known someone in your heart you just thought, you thought, that, boy, they're this close. They're this close. You know, that doesn't count. You know, that the, this close doesn't count. You're either in or not. This close doesn't count. Being around it, rubbing shoulders with others that are, hearing about it, this close, you might as well be a long way away. Can I give you, in three minutes, I think, a simple gospel. How's that for a simplified message series? A simple gospel. And I can give it to you, and I think it's on the back of your handout. I can give it to you in one verse. And that's it. Romans 6, 23. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, I left a blank on your handout, so if you want to jot down the note, you got room if you want to. Now, I, am, I have no artistic ability I can draw lines. I feel like that sloth or whatever, that slew, whatever it is on that commercial, and he's trying to draw the word, and they're trying to guess it on Pictionary, and he draws one line. That's me. That's, that's, I felt like I was playing Pictionary with them because that's how it is a lot of times. They have no clue what I'm drawing. But this one, if we could do it this way, we'll do the bridge that you're probably familiar with, the bridge track, and we'll do it something like this. I could do this on a napkin. I could do this on the back of that paper you got. I could do this on lots of things. And I could put uh, me or someone I'm talking to, a person, and they are smiley, smiley. And over here, I have God. And there's a divide, as we can see. And here's what Romans chapter 6, verse 23 tells us. It says, the wages... Now, if you could use one word for wages, what would it be? What you earned, payment, compensation, wages, what you earned. The wages for this uh, scallywag right here, it says this, of sin. Now, normally when I ask someone if they ever sinned, I've never got anyone who told me they never sinned. And normally, they have lots of things that flash in their mind, and I'm often thankful they don't tell me what flashes in their mind when they think about sin. All I know is they know. But you can name many sins. But the, way, the, the wages or the payment or the compensation of what we've earned for sinning is this, debt. That's it. <clears throat> go to work next week, and they say, hey, you get up paid, you're going to die. That's what sin does for us. The wages, the payment, the compensation for sin is death. But here, this is a great three-letter word in the New Testament. But, I'll put it right there. It's a great bridge word. I love it. But, then we can go over and we can talk about what God does. Now, 
person's payment, wages for sin is death. But God has a correction, and that gift, you get a gift from God, somebody's got to pay for the gift, right? Somebody has to pay for it. Somebody has to pay for the gift. God paid for the gift. He offers it. The gift of God is eternal life. That's the gift. It's a beautiful thing. But how do we get from here to here? Because we got a gap, and he gives it to us as he always does, Jesus Christ. And you got the cross right there, and I'm terrible with it, but we could write Jesus Christ. And you notice it has to go through him, and that comes in trusting. That's the gospel in one verse. I know we want to make it more complicated, and I know that many want to ask lots of questions, and they want to say lots of their own buts. But the Word of God says the wages or the payment for sin is death. Everybody dies. For sin entered this world by one man, Adam. Everyone born afterwards got it. Going to die. The payment is death. But God paid for a gift and the sacrifice of his son, Jesus Christ, and he gives it. Trust in him. Gospel, one verse. As simple as that sounds, we would be rejoicing if everybody in Collegeville just said, wow, that is profound. I accept. They admit they're sinners. They believe that Jesus Christ died for their sins. They commit their life to him and him alone. That's the gospel. That's the gospel. And we find that many want to make it too complicated. If, if there was one message on Simplified Series uh, that I have, I'd pray it was this one. This one. That we live a simple life that we would love God and we would love people. And we'd love them enough that we would share the gospel. If it's in one verse, terrific. If you want to go do the whole Romans road or you want to take John 3, 16 and let that be your one verse, the word of God is powerful. It's no discerner of persons. It is sharp. It will penetrate hearts. Give them that. If you're listening online, you know what? You can look at this again. You can go to your Bible. You can ask the questions. But trust God. Don't be like the scribe and be this close because that doesn't count. It doesn't count. Either in or not. Father, we're grateful that you're so clear, and you've given us a profound message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Would you find us faithfully loving you more today, this week, and loving other people, and being faithful to share the gospel of Jesus Christ to others? Thank you for allowing us to hear it and respond to it and be your children. Might we live like it tonight and this week. In Christ's name I pray, amen.